saying that we're being live streamed. Yeah. Okay. So good morning. Good morning. And welcome. Welcome, Claudette Rowley. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. Great Thursdays to see you. with Culture Talk. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Great to connect here. Um, for those of you who are joining us for this morning's conversation, um, I'd like to welcome you to our weekly uh, podcast, video cast. Mm -hmm. um, if you have seen Thursdays with Culture Talk in the past, then you know that we get together every week, um, Cynthia Horstman, my partner and I at Culture Talk, and we also frequently invite experts and guests who can help us to bring really relevant, timely conversations regarding workplace culture. And I'm excited that this morning we have Claudette Rowley as our guest. Claudette has been um, working with Culture Talk for several years now. And it's been really exciting to watch her journey and some of the things that she's brought to this conversation and to this community. And today she's going to share with us a culture shift initiative, something that um, she has been actively working on over the course of several years. So I think it's really exciting to have the deep insight that she's been able to um, bring to this conversation and to share sort of what, what was the genesis and mm -hmm. the journey of this culture shift and what are some of the takeaways and the outcomes? Because it's not a one-stop project. It's mm -hmm. not an event, right? It is right. a commitment. Mm -hmm. So before we dive in a little bit to the Applitech case study, I want to tell you a little bit about Claudette and give her a chance to introduce herself. So Claudette has a background in change management, um, in culture work, and as a coach. She's also the author uh, of a book based on a culture management and change system that she designed called Cultural Brilliance. So she's got a, a lot of experience and insight, and uh, she's been a fantastic member of the Culture Talk community. So Claudette, tell us a little bit more about that, that professional journey um, that brought you to today. Well, thanks. Thanks, Teresa, and great to be here. Yeah, been looking forward to it. Um, yeah, it's interesting, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, like the genesis of all of this for me literally goes back 30 years. Um, <laughs> and I'll be, I'll be quick, but I'll be brief, but, you know, <laughs> And, and when I was working in organizations and I noticed that um, as an employee and I noticed how the culture impacted me, right? That I, I had a great, I was in an organization, it was actually state government um, and I had a great manager and I was working on a great team and I noticed how I thrived and grew and I had great opportunities. Then I went and I left there and, and moved to a different state and was working for another organization and the culture was pretty toxic. And I reflect and I noticed how I changed. I was less confident. It was harder to get things done, you know, and there was a sort of this dramatic impact on me having this succession of really good and not so good, you know, and I, I got really interested in leadership and I started reading books on leadership and it sort of one thing led to the next, you know, it piqued my mm -hmm. interest. Like how, how can we change organizations? How can we lead them more effectively? Right. There has to be a better way to do this right, than, yeah. than having something really dysfunctional that uh, that hurts people and causes things to not work very well. Um, yeah. So you notice yeah. the tangibility aspect of the culture right, right away. A lot right of away. Go. Yeah. 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 I just I observed it. It was it was really interesting to me. Um, uh, and then I um, I decided to become a coach. Um, mm -hmm. And so then I started working, you know, of course, individually with people, leaders and people in career transition and people wanting to find their life purpose and things like that initially. And that, you know, that's looking at the, the individual culture of a person, right? What are their mindsets? What are their beliefs? How does this all, you know, how do they think about things and how does that stop them or move them forward, right? So, um, and then from there, um, I, then I started my own business and then I started to weave in consulting because I was really interested in working with organizations, you know, individuals and organizations. And all of that work with organizations led me to getting, kind of took me back to my interest. I never, I never lost my interest in culture but it took a while to figure out how to make impact in culture, right? In a direct way. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, 
yeah, so all, all of that brought me to the, as you mentioned, the cultural brain system I put together um, and used in my consulting business, you know, for a, a few years until I moved into this, you know, director of people and culture role. But mm-hmm. yeah, so it's been an interesting journey the last few decades. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love um, the aspect of it that you shared right mm-hmm. from the get go. What you recognized is that it was personal. Yeah. So here you are, and here we are having this conversation about organizational culture, and yet the net outcome and impact of that is the personal impact that it has mm-hmm. on the human beings and, and each right. individual in the system. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I know you talk about culture as a system. Could you talk a little bit more about the cultural brilliance system? And the, I know that's the, the you know topic that you use um, mm-hmm. for your book. So yeah. tell us a little bit about, you know, what are the high points or the, the key yeah. ideas from culture yeah. brilliance? Thanks. Yeah. Some of the key ideas are that, you know, the cultures, my belief that cultures can be brilliant, just like people, you know, we all have this natural brilliance as individuals. Um, and I believe organizations and their cultures have these threads of brilliance running through them, right? If you can, if you can tap into it, if you can find it, you can transform it. Um, so, you know, brilliant cultures, as you would imagine, are these very highly, you know, highly functioning cultures. Doesn't mean they're perfect, right? But they have, you know, they have a set of values that they live by. Um, they work to continuously improve things. They look at their communication and they're really looking at how can we bring out the best in people and the best in, in the organization, right? I, I so often would see organizations leave all this potential on the table right. when I was consulting because the cultures weren't where they needed to be. You know, you, and it's easy as a consultant to stand back and be like, well, if they did this and they changed that, right? Right. It would easy. be so much better. And it's easier said than done. Yeah, completely. But mm-hmm. but you can see it. You can see the potential. Um, so that's the basic, you know, kind of the high, very high level premise. And then um, the cultural brilliant system is a change, you know, without going into a lot of detail, it's a, it's a more of a step-by-step systematic process for changing a culture, mm-hmm. right? Kind of a, a roadmap to follow. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and, um, you know, going back to the idea that culture is a system and that culture is not an event, right? um, that it's a long-term commitment, Mm -hmm. which is what you knew when you did move into Athletech and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you were part of, now you're on the inside, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Talk about that that transition from being a consultant and, uh, being able to see things from the 30,000 foot view. And then all of a sudden you're down in the trenches with yeah. the leadership, one of the leaders in the organization. Mm-hmm. Um, so what was that like to um, now all of a sudden be responsible for one culture as opposed to mm-hmm. consulting and working with numerous clients? Mm-hmm. Um, what did you see when you, when you got on the inside? And- yeah, thanks. I think for me, and that's a great question. Personally, um, it, was a, it, it was a really nice, it's been a nice change, mm-hmm. right? Because I, I was... Um, and for two levels, one, I was really um, interested in being part of a work community again, mm-hmm. you know, after 20 years of being on my own. And of course I had colleagues, but it's not the same thing, right? So being on the inside, you have more of, you're, you become more woven into the fabric of the organization, right. which is, you know, kind of has this positives and this drawbacks. Um, but the other thing I saw, you know, I also saw that if you are a strong leader in culture, you can affect a lot of positive change. So that's been one of the huge benefits of becoming an employee, right? And a leader in the company is, you know, I have a lot of ability to make positive change and to get buy-in, you know, and, and pull, you know, move people along with it. Um, so that's been a huge benefit to, yeah, to being yeah. an employee. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and um, with your skill set, and mm-hmm. you can tell us a, maybe a sneak peek about what your personal archetypes are and how you bring that view um, to your internal role. But I imagine, knowing what I know about you, um, (laughs) that you have still that 30,000 foot view and also the ability to be a little bit more in the weeds. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, so tell us a little bit about that. Like, what's your, what is your personal archetype profile and um, Mm -hmm. and how does that help you to do this job? You know, and and then we'll dive into the case study a little bit about, you know, where you've taken it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so my primary archetype is magician, right? It's all about transformation and uh, and then hero and ruler. And and I would say that it's, you know, when I learned about that, I initially took the culture talk assessment, individual assessment um, and magician was first. I was like, well, that explains so much, right? Because <laughs> I am I am driven to transform things, 
Right. Mm-hmm. I am. I am. If I'm not transform, it could be a de- redecorating a room in my house. Like there's all form- sorts of tr- forms of transformation, right? Yeah. It's not all right. So um, I-, I had this drive to transform things. And you see, you definitely would see that throughout the company, right? There are something I turn over a stone, like, well, this isn't working very well. Why are we doing this, this way? Out again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Here I am. Right. So, um, and I think, and then hero, you know, doing what it takes to get the job done. Right. So that mm-hmm. sense of urgency, that sense of um, like, OK, this is really impacting people. We need to do something about this is yeah. often you know, what I'm thinking. And the last one's ruler. Um, and I, I think that, you know, with the, I am a fairly structured person. I believe that there are times to be very precise about things. And I think that's mm-hmm. where that shows up. Um, and also being able to you know, follow a system and a process. Right. And to be able to I'm sometimes the person who's saying some of the tougher things that, you know, I'm saying that thing no one really wants to hear, which is we need to change this. We need to improve this. Right. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the ways I, you know, I, I see those playing out. Um, And you're right. I do try to keep the 30,000 foot view because I think leaders need to, it's really important. Mm -hmm. And the details for me, you know, I'm not a super detailed person, but the details for me are, are when I see the details impacting that larger picture right yeah impacting that the little dream, the vision the goal yeah right and it's like mm-hmm. these little details keep tripping us up we need to fix this yeah 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 so um so you come in um mm-hmm. meeting people and culture what did you what did you find when you got to apple tech a few years mm-hmm. ago and um and what were the sort of driving motivators to begin this journey for culture transformation and culture change yeah, thanks. So I came, I came in the four years ago, and um, I spent the first couple of years still in the consulting role, uh, and then moved into the larger employee role. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, so really, as a consultant, it was um, the organization, you know, is, is Applitech is a small manufacturing company, mm-hmm. uh, just to give people context, and we manufacture glues and adhesives that are used in the defense industry on medical devices, right? So we're a very niche kind of organization. Um and so it was it, you know, it's, a, it's manufacturing. So it's a super, super hands-on work. So it's all about operations. It's all about on-time delivery, right? It's all about our systems and processes. And so what was happening is the sales had increased and operations was um, having some difficulty adapting to that change, right? Changing how they were operating to be right. able to meet, meet, meet the, the needs. Meet the new demand. Meet the new yeah. demand, exactly. So, and, and as I talked with the CEO, with someone I already knew more about it, I, every time we talked about it, I'm like, this uh, I'd done some consulting here in the past, so I was already knew them and they knew me. Um, I said, this sounds like a culture issue. That's what I kept coming back to. You mm-hmm. know, it's not just, it's not just operations, right? right? right. Not but just it, increased sales, it's not just, it's, it's all these systems mm-hmm. and processes that were not where they, that had supported the company well in the past, but were no longer supporting the company well with the change, right. which is so much what we see, right? In organizations, something worked well for a while and then. Right. And Something we get to flow and adapt in it. Yeah, okay. we get we get yeah. not always they use the word stuck so much as yeah. our perception is yeah. this works. This works, right. So we'll keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. So we keep doing it and we haven't got maybe that outside perspective or yeah. that thirty thousand foot view to say, like, well, that no longer makes any sense. Exactly. It no, no longer works, whether it like to your point, it's just um one system mm-hmm. or whether it's coming from something deeper, right. um, the cultural change. And I think that um, one of the things that's so interesting about culture work is it's never just one system. No. And mm-hmm. it one thing impacts the next and the attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that keep us from mm-hmm. seeing what changes we need to make um, are happening not just in one place. Mm-hmm. So I although it's agree. easy to point, it's easy to point fingers, right? It's easy yeah. to say, oh, yeah. it's operations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's hiring, <laughs> right? It's the leader, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So how do you break that down? What was what was your first step? Like what did you set out to do? Well, in my my process that I use the cultural brilliance um, process, the first piece is assessment, like a lot of people do. I call it authenticity, but it's really about I want to deeply understand the reality of how an organization and the culture operates, right? Mm-hmm. How is this culture really working now without judgment? Um, so it's a, it's a non-judgmental process. Of course, I use the culture talk, you know, organizational assessment. Um, mm-hmm. I had been certified in like, maybe four months before I started doing this project. So it was great yeah. timing. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, perfect. And um, 
so I, I used that. And then we also, we did a half day offsite. Um, so we did, an, I did interviewing. So we did a number of different things to really create the cultural, the profile, right? If, right. if you will, right? And then how the culture is operating now. Um, right. Pointing. Just, yeah, really, yeah, pointing. And I think that, you know, a few, just a few highlights of things that came up at that point was um, where it was a culture where people um, didn't feel comfortable speaking up. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there are problems not there are problems not getting solved or ideas maybe would come up but then no one would do anything with them. Um, we also saw that um, there had been a um, sort of an us versus them, a management versus folks who in, you know in in production. And we saw we also saw that, you know there were three or four people in the organization that held all this tribal knowledge like and and it wasn't being disseminated to other people. Right. So there are a lot of there are a lot of factors and variables that were driving things in the direction they were going. Yeah. I mean, and the Which stress is the real was risk. super high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, those things are yeah. cultural problems, but they sound like business risks for mm -hmm. for people who um, think, you know, strictly from a business perspective and think culture is a nice, fluffy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think it's really important, you know, the, what you're doing here, which is tying together the culture problems with we, you know, clearly identified business risks. Yeah, that's a great so, point. Yeah, it, to me, culture and business risks are incredibly intertwined, right? Mm -hmm. I, 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 and I think that's kind of the case for culture and a lot of, you know, it, this, these are business, these are real world business risks you're going to face. Right. You don't handle these things, right? This is not about, you know, the social engagement in the company or the, you know, it's not about that. It's not about yeah. how many parties we have, right? So, exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. And tied to yeah. business yeah. goals. So, yeah. I mean, I heard you talk about sales and yeah. the increase in sales. So here the yeah. company is growing from yeah. a revenue perspective. I imagine that means there needed to be a headcount growth mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. recruiting and manufacturing has been no picnic. I can imagine we can talk about that a little yes. bit. Yeah. But, you know, so some business goals um, identified growth mm -hmm. and some business risks uncovered. Yeah. Uh, potential sure. brain drain if one of those, right. um, you know, knowledge holders goes away and mm -hmm. uh, the inability to, to, you know, have teams gel if there's an us versus them mentality. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Can you tie some of those things? So when you did the first culture assessment a few years ago. Yeah. Can you tie the outcomes, like some of those profiles mm -hmm. uh, and the archetype patterns that you measured to some of the specific risks and, um, you know, maybe opportunities that you uncovered? Yeah, absolutely. We, um, we, you know, as you know, we've done the survey three times, which is really great, right? Yeah. Just let everyone know. So I, I can actually track our changes through the Culture Talk organizational survey, which I know we'll get into a little later, right? But which is neat. I love yeah. it. You know, we take it. We're like, yeah. oh, this is how we changed, and this is why. Mm -hmm. um, but and originally, we um, the organization scored as a hero, innocent ruler, mm -hmm. um, and we could really. And what was what was really, um, it just it was great to see the engagement that people were engaged in the process when we in the or employees at the time when we debriefed, they really made the case for it. We're like, yep. You know, and unfortunately, there were we were there were strengths, but there were also a lot of the shadow sides of each of these right. archetypes operational, right. operationally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'd see like Hero as the top, and and it was people were racing to get product manufactured and out the door, which was wonderful. But the downside was the problems causing that high level of stress and urgency weren't getting resolved. So that was one example, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it was more like the hamster on the wheel kind of, a, you know, we just keep going, right? Um, yeah. You know, I think with innocent ruler. Um, there were positives in the sense of people, there were people here who I think really believed in the company and cared about the relationships and things like that, right? And from an innocent perspective and were trusting, but on the other side, you know, there was a lot of kind of um, people, as I said, people not feeling free to be empowered to speak up, mm -hmm. right? And, and more just things, things kept under wraps. You were also losing people's ideas. Um, and with Ruler, it was more around, you know, feeling that there were certain kinds of rules that had to be followed and there wasn't a lot of, um, again, room to say, speak up and say, what if we tried this instead? Right. A little creativity. That flexibility. Yeah. The creativity. Yeah. 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 And I think that that dynamic yeah. is one that we might see paired, you know, the, mm -hmm. the innocent and the ruler, they actually kind of support one another at times. Yeah. yeah. So where there is a lot of structure and um, things are laid out in detail, these, these are the way things to do. There might also be a population that says, well, okay, 
I trust you and I'm going to follow along and that not raise too many questions, maybe mm-hmm. not share my ideas to your point. Right. So there are ways in which, I mean, I think there's always like, how did we get here? Yes. And, you know, given the, the industry and mm-hmm. the customer base that mm-hmm. you're serving, you can kind of see, right? So there's always an understanding um, as well that might come when you look at how did we get here? Yeah. You've got to have rules and structure because of, of the, you know, clients talk a little bit about you know, the customers and who yeah. are selling your product. Very, very regulated. Very, it's very yeah. regulated. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. I mean, you do. And one thing I, you know, looked back, so there had been people who'd worked in the company for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, which is great. And when you have people who've been around that long, right, sometimes they feel like we've always done it this way, right? Right. We're going to continue to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, or they don't, they, they don't see maybe as much of the, you know, 30,000 foot view anymore because they've been here for so long, right? right. So that was also, I think, playing into some of the dynamics I described. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So you set out to make some changes. Yeah. Um, and so tell us what was, what was the goal of some of the year mm-hmm. one? Yeah. Year one. Yeah, we, changes. yeah. Right. We really, um, we put together a plan um, and the key, the key things that came out of our assessment work, our authenticity work were um, creating uh, an empowered workforce. Right. Mm-hmm. So we talked a lot about ownership. We wanted people to own their jobs. And we realized, well, the flip side of ownership, you can't ask people to own things they're not empowered to own, right? So right away, empowerment and ownership became words. And we still use those words four years later, right? Mm-hmm. Things that we talked about. And we did more than talk, of course. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing we talked, we realized is we needed to, you know, as I've already mentioned, let people have a voice and share ideas. It took a long time for that. We wanted to create an environment of psychological safety, mm-hmm. right? That we're, you know, psychological safety being a team, a place that's safe for interpersonal risk taking. Right. And we still orient new employees to that to this day, right? Mm-hmm. When they're new to the company. So I wanted to create an empowered workforce, people who owned um, their jobs, people who felt psychologically safe, um, and that were very open to learning and growing and, and being professional. So those were the key things that came out of the assessment at a high mm-hmm. level, right? That we started to focus on. So come some of the actions we took. Um, I just, you know, I started meeting with what did I call them? Um, they were called production improvement teams, I think. And I started meeting once a week with teams of people off, off from our production floor and like, okay, so what are the issues you're encountering? What are some of the ideas? Yeah. We had had a lot of um, bottlenecks. What are the bottlenecks you're encountering, right? And they started to collect this information. And then I would actually work with them to take action to solve things, mm. right? So this is this role I took as sort of advocate and mentor. Like we, we can actually get something done here, right. right? We can advocate, we can make changes. So um, we did a, thing, a lot of things like that. We did a lot of training in the company around some of these ideas. Um, mm-hmm. Like I said, we, I mean, one of the biggest things that we did to build trust with the employees was to actually correct things that weren't working well. Right. So actually, so right. actually, actually yeah. sure, walk your talk. Walk your talk, right? Yeah. Because you cannot ask people to change and then say, oh, but we're not going to fix your X, Y, and Z equipment, mm-hmm. or we're not going to get you what you need, but you need to be empowered. That's that right. makes sense. Yeah, it's right. Fun. Right. So we did a lot of real world problem solving um, to build trust. Yeah. yeah. And so um, who was part of that? So you were one of yeah. the leaders yeah. taking part of that, but how yeah. did that extend out to the rest of the leadership team? And, you know, were they participating in these or what mm-hmm. was the, yeah. you know, um, the way that people came together around mm-hmm. those actions, the action plans? Yeah, so we had um, the CEO was very, very involved, of course, because you know, as we know, as the CEO, the top leaders are not involved. This is not going to work, right? right? So he was mm-hmm. highly involved. I was very involved, of course, as a consultant initially. Um, we had other managers in the organization, right, who you know worked hard to get them to buy in. We also um, had them involved. We also really um, asked some of the key long-term employees that were highly respected Mm-hmm. To get very involved, to be on teams, you know, to participate because people were looking to them, right, to see right. what they were doing. Yeah, so those respond were... to this. Right, right, yeah. right. What is happening? Was that, you know, is Bob, oh, Bob's not, he's not very interested in this. I don't know if I should be, you mm-hmm. know, just to make, clarify, we had no one named Bob working there, <laughs> which is why I use that name. Um, so, right, but it's, it's, it's that, or, you know, it's Bob or Samantha or whatever. How's he or she looking? Oh, well, they're not so into it. So I, you know, we knew that we had to get the key people motivated to participate in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. To get yeah. 
So you set out to make some changes and then you went back, as you said, and measured. Yep. Have we actually started to shift the culture and, Mm -hmm. you know, then at that point also realigned, well, what, um, what actions, behaviors are, are different now? And yeah. how are they benefiting these business goals back to the, you know, the yeah. goals that we're trying to create. So how long was it? I think it was even just a year, maybe a year and 18 months before you did the second assessment. Yeah, it was about a year and a half, year and three mm-hmm. quarters. Um, yeah. A couple other things we, we did. Yes, we, we scored differently. We had different archetypes, two different archetypes. One of the things we realized too was we needed to dramatically improve the training program in the company. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing we worked on a lot in terms of another it's very country. very empowering, actually, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and what we were doing wasn't getting the right results. We also didn't have the right people in the right seats in a lot of places. So I also took on um, a revamp of the higher, you know, the hiring process, the hiring initiative, right? So mm-hmm. we changed how we did that. So these are really concrete things that, that, you know, made a big difference um, in the company, right? So we needed to hire people that really were a fit for the culture. So we are, when we're even to this day, and I'm in charge of hiring, um, the recruiters that we work with are very aware of our culture and our expectations. Right. right? So we hired a different level. Um, so the second, yeah. So the next time we took it at the end of 2019, um, the culture talk survey, we came out as a sage caregiver hero. So okay. we are very, you know, we are excited to see those changes. Right. Um, and what those directly connect to is by increasing our training in the company and really saying, we empower you employees to have the information you need to do your job really well we thought that's where the sage came out, right? Is this yeah, kind of subject sure. matter expertise, right? Right. And and we are in a very, as I mentioned, very precise area of manufacturing. So you do need to know a lot to do well, right? Um, and yeah. people, it's, so they have this, you know, all this they need to learn when they come into the company. So we saw sage there. We then we caregiver was our second archetype um, that time, and we really connected that to the mentoring and the coaching and training we'd been doing internally. Right. You know, people that. were personally. Yeah. Right, the difference, right? So it goes back to yeah, very beginnings of your culture work. Yes, personal connection to feeling like somebody cares about you in the environment. Yeah, Um, absolutely. Someone cares about you and trains you, and you're part of a team, right? Right, and and that all this matters, right? All this matters. Uh, And then hero uh, showed up again, and that's. was still related to, you know, urgency, doing what it takes to get the job done. Yeah. Right. But in a more positive way. So, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the, there's, um, if you bring up a good point, there are both strength and shadow sides to each mm-hmm. of these patterns. And when you validate a profile, you might be validating, the, you know, um, one or both. You might find that we have, in fact, organizations tend to have both sides showing up. So mm-hmm. when we're, when everything's humming along and it's going well, then we might more, you know, be functioning on the strength of that pattern. Mm-hmm. And when we are under stress and we slip into the shadow, we, you know, are then really bringing up some of those toxic um, behaviors mm-hmm. or those behaviors that aren't driving you forward. So yeah. there's um, a lot of different ways to look at that hero perhaps. Yeah, yeah, it works, right? With these patterns, again, they they um, exist in a culture because at some level they are working for us. Yeah. So creating awareness around, let's be cautious not to step over the line or step mm-hmm. into the shadow of that behavior and recognize when it's not serving us, when it's coming up in ways that are having a negative impact. Um, yeah. Toxic. Absolutely. And, and we did, you know, each time we did the culture talk survey, we did a whole company debrief, right? And we, we did some different exercises around it and really got everybody's opinion on that. And that really helped us understand what, what were the strengths and where was the shadow operating, right? And I did right. look at, we, you know, had people mark, you know, write their ideas on big flip chart pieces of paper around the company and like, wow, oh, I had no idea there were some people that thought this. Wow, I had no idea that was, ha- you know, as much as you think you know what's going on, you never really right. know everything. <laughs> so oh, yeah. there's always more. Um, but it, yeah, to your point, it really understanding where you're crossing that line. Like with Hero, it's great to be urgent, do what it takes to get the job done. But when do we need to stop and say we need a strategic solution? Exactly. Something, right. right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious as well, when I'm picturing this session with Mm -hmm. people, you know, really stepping up now, they seem more empowered um, to actually share their ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, 
how effective, um, you know, even just in that process of inviting people to the conversation and, um, you know, are they starting to understand uh, what, you know, the language and the patterns are, you mentioned using, using some of these terms over and over again, like how yeah. is that helpful in developing a language around your culture? I think it's, it, the, I think the rep repetition is real. It's, just, you know, repetition in marketing, right. And public uh -huh. relations, you know, it's in the repetition really helps. Um, when, like I said, when we interview people, we talk about the culture, um, when we orient, I do a people and culture orientation. I actually have a slide that says, this is some of our cultural vocabulary. And I always say, you know, we're not a cult, you know, you don't have to use <laughs> these words, but you're going to hear, you're going to hear them. Right. So I want to explain why they're important right. to us. Right. Um, you know, one, one example is we, um, a term we use called direct language, which just it got it developed sort of organically, but it's real, you know, it's what it sounds like that we will be direct with each other and give feedback if needed, that we're not going to beat around the bush or sugarcoat it, right? If if you're perfor not performing the way you need to, you can count on us to tell you. To tell you, right. Right. We're going to tell you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And and then being able to couch that in um in some of the understanding of what those archetype patterns are, mm -hmm. um, you know, can be really beneficial as well. Absolutely. So you um then measured again, um, yes. late in 2021, I believe, right? So right. just about five months ago, mm -hmm. um, since we're almost at the end of May already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and you had some cha some changes again, and just curious, um, you know, where are you today? And you know, what what would be your look back? Now you've got a few years worth of data and yeah. anecdotes, and um, you know, I'd also love you to share the growth that the company has experienced. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, at a time when it has been challenging to hire, sounds like you guys are doing a good job. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Definitely challenging to hire. Speaking since I know that personally and intimately, right. As I'm doing that, it feels like almost every week. Um, but we, uh, yeah, we've about doubled in size. We're just at around 50 employees now. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've been very, this one, you know, all very strategic, very, you know, intentional around, um, different areas of growth in the company. So the company is, yeah, the company is doing very well. Um, we what have actually, we have weathered the pandemic very well, other than the supply chain issues everyone is experiencing. Right. Um, but we've done, you know, and I think a lot of that has to do with our culture, you know, with the fact that people were able to come together as a community, you know, and do what needed to be done um, mm -hmm. throughout this process that we've, are this, not process, right? This pandemic that we've all experienced. Um, mm -hmm. So that, I mean, so looking back on that, I would say that, you know, the culture work we've or we, looking back at the last four years, I would say the culture work we've done has been really successful um, in transforming the culture, but also really, really meeting the needs of the business. Going back full circle to where we started yeah. at the beginning of the conversation, yeah. right? To fixing those business risks, to identifying additional business risks, you know, to coming up with plans, you know, really understanding our Achilles heels, so to mm -hmm. speak, as a company, right? And working yeah. to remedy those, yeah. The so things that we might just slip back into. So things are going well, right. and all of a sudden we look back and say, "Oh, look, we're back here again," or we, you know, rest yeah. a little bit. Um, yeah. Well, I also um, really appreciate that as a manufacturing company during the pandemic, you didn't have the luxury of work from home. No, we did not. Oh, we work. Yeah. You know, right. In right. A, in a manufacturing setting. So, how do you think the culture work? played or what role did the culture work play in helping you, be, you know, move through that so successfully? Thanks. I think it was, it, it was that we positioned when the pandemic first started and none of us, of course, knew what was going on. Right. right? Really. <laughs> um, yeah. And what was going to happen and how long it would last and, and all that good stuff. Um, we really positioned this as an opportunity for us to come together as a community, you know, and we leaned heavily on this, this idea of community and, and said, you know, this could bring out the worst in us, or this could bring out the best in us. And I remember saying that in front of the you know, weekly company meetings most of the time. And I remember saying that in front of the company, right? This is an opportunity to rise to this occasion, right? right? Or we could just all fall apart and stress, but that's not going to help us. I mean, yes, it was very stressful, right? But, mm -hmm. but there was an opportunity to come together. So, um, so I think that the culture work really allowed us to do that. Um, the other thing the culture work did is because we had been through a lot of changes as a company already. People right. were used to that. They yeah, were used to us making changes, right? Yeah. Right. So, so not, so they, so it wasn't when we started, you know, we implemented our COVID policies when we, you know, had to change some of the ways we were working. It wasn't that, you know, I, 
people may have not liked it, but they were used to the, the fact that we would make changes. We would adapt to things mm -hmm. you know, as needed. And so I think that made it easier too. That wheel was greased in other words already. Right. Yeah. yeah. And some yeah. trust built around trust was built. Yeah. how you were going to handle the changes. Um, yeah. Yeah. That we would be communicating a lot about it because we do, mm -hmm. right. We would be talking about it, that we would put policies in place that tried to keep, you know, people safe. Um, right. to try to keep all of us healthy um you know and we do that you know right now we have our we're wearing masks again right because our covid ca ca cases in new england where i am uh, we are have risen again right mm -hmm. i don't have my mask on now because i'm with you with my, you know office with the door shut but you right. know if i, I, once I leave this office yeah. i have a mask on again right? right yeah 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 and um and then going to the the mm -hmm. final culture survey that you did yeah. or the most recent culture survey that you did yeah. um, last year how did that show up in the culture survey that response to the pandemic what do you think some of the things that um mm -hmm. you found yeah be reflective I think, you know, we, we all, our top archetype was Sage again, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, we've continued to improve our training program in the third iteration. We've continued to um, push knowledge to the organization. So that's good, you know, and I'm glad right. Sage was there the again. The cornerstone. The that's cornerstone, true. right, right. And yeah. um, then our second ar highest archetype was Innocent uh, this time again. And Innocent um, this time, as you may recall, it came up, you know, in 2018, right, and resurfaced in 2021. I think it was really around um, the level of trust uh, mm -hmm. people had in us as leaders throughout the pandemic, right? There was this sort of trust that we would take care of people and do the right things right? versus, yeah, we don't care if you're sick, come to, we don't care if you've been exposed to COVID, you have it's to be at work Everybody anyway. get over it. We got to get a job done. <laughs> right. More. And we were the opposite. You know, you, you need to not be at work right now, right? Mm -hmm. Let's get you tested. Let's figure out what's going, you know, right? There's right. a very different approach. So I think that that showed up there. And then our third archetype was every person. And um, we really interpreted that as, and by, by we, I mean the whole company again. It's not right. just Which is now double the else. size. So right. as, yeah. you're, as you're bringing this survey out to people, there right. are many more inputs, right? There's many more inputs, right? And a lot of new people. So new perspectives, right. fresh perspectives. But, I, you know, every person we try to have a there's a hierarchy in the company, of course, but we try to have a democratic, kind of a democratic approach. We mm -hmm. don't use that word, but it reminds me of, you know, every person, right? That we're all in this together. We want to hear what you have to say, right? right. If you have a good idea, or you're, you're bringing up something reasonable that you can show facts and evidence to support. We're probably going to do something about it. Right. You, well, you know, that's I a mean, combination, right? I'm yeah. here stage, right? Make sure yeah. you have facts and evidence to support right. it. Right, right. But do bring it up. Bring it forward Bring and it forward, use, your, yeah. use your voice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Use, use your voice. And, and we're a data rich organization. So get the data. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, there's not, there's not a lot of ambiguity in, in what we do. Right. right. So get the data. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Very yeah, nice. Yeah. Well, it's, um, it has been exciting to watch as mm -hmm. you've gone through uh, the, the multi year progression with this. And mm -hmm. uh, we sincerely appreciate your sharing that with us today. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Um, thank as you. As well as the ongoing partnership. So thank you so much, Claudette, for being with us and sharing your experiences on Thursdays with Culture Talk. Thanks, Teresa. I appreciate it. It was fun. Yeah. yeah. Good yeah. to see you. And um, we will see you again next week. Uh, we'll be bringing another topic, taking a look at purpose mm -hmm. and how organizational purpose is also tied to the culture conversation. So um, we'll look forward to seeing you again then and uh, have a great week. Bye. Bye.